adrenaline, the captivating hormone released by your adrenal glands in response to stress. It's your body's way of preparing for battle. It orchestrates a symphony of physiological changes that elevate your heart, your blood pressure, and your breathing. This sensational shift primes you for action, enabling you to confront perceived threats head-on or flee with unmatched speed. The old narrative 10 years ago was that if you're feeling depressed, just smile. Well, if that worked, <laughs> right. we would have a lot less depression than we see. There are... There's an interesting study um, done by a very controversial guy named Robert Heath. These were studies that were published mainly in the 1960s. You couldn't do them now. Um, where they took humans, mm -hmm. implanted them with electrodes in their brain, so drilled down below the skull. Mm -hmm. These weren't people that had epilepsy. These were just people that volunteered for these studies. Dopamine system is an incredible system because it is, it is depletable and yet it's also renewable and it is self-amplifying. What I mean by that is, let's say that I'm somebody who doesn't know what I'm working toward. I don't have a specific goal or question. By completing even what seem like menial tasks, like making myself a cup of coffee, drinking it, cleaning up completely, drying the cup and putting yeah. it back in the cupboard, what happens is if even if you make that seemingly trivial goal, the goal, in addition to making the kitchen look nicer, it completes a circuit. It closes the dopaminergic yes. circuit. And when dopamine is released, and it will be, maybe not to the same extent as publishing a novel, but to some extent, dopamine amplifies our ability to think into the future, to make additional yeah. plans that are unrelated to what you just did. The nervous system includes the brain, which we now know includes the eyes as well, the spinal cord, and then what's called the peripheral nervous system, all the connections with the body and every organ in our body, our heart, our diaphragm, our lungs, our spleen, our liver, all of it is, is it, as we say, innervated. It receives Connected nerve connections. To the brain? That's right, from the brain and spinal cord. So much so that if we were to just dissolve away everything except the nervous system, if we had a human nervous system splayed out here on the table in front of us, it would look like a human being. There would be a connection at every level down to, you'd be able to say that's the big toe and that's the pinky and that's where the heart would belong because it's almost like a silhouette of our entire body. And so when we think about the nervous system, it's really important, I think, for people to understand that the nervous system is all of that, brain and body and all the connections back and forth. And you know, there have been thousands of years of debates about what's the mind, what's the brain, et cetera, the mind-body problem, all that. I think it's fair to say in 2020 that states of mind include the brain, the activity of the brain and the body. Those two things coordinate, the brain and the body and have a sort of what I call a contract. There's a brain body contract that gives rise to things like states of mind. Well, for the following reason, we all think about caloric energy, but what most people are never taught, you know, and if I had 10 things I could teach people, one of them would be adrenaline, epinephrine, is neural energy. It's your ability to get up and go. It's the thing that makes you jittery when you're a little nervous, but it's also what allows you to move forward, to go out for a run, to pursue any goal, cognitive or physical, etc. Epinephrine, which is also adrenaline, those are the same thing, is literally manufactured from the molecule dopamine. If you look at the biochemical cascade, it is dopamine is converted into adrenaline, which is the basis of all energy, all neural energy. Right, right. And so right. including thinking. And so if one is not in a place of being able to uh, set their goal on a particular lofty goal, a graduate degree, a book, et cetera, yet the way one gets to that is by completing things mm -hmm. in their immediate environment. Yeah. So the brain and nervous system. Um, which, so it's like brain, spinal cord, connections with the body and back again. I don't distinguish between brain and mind. I think that's like an 80s discussion or earlier. And I think it, it, it would take us down the wrong track. So brain or mind to me is interchangeable. Mm -hmm. um, mind body is kind of interchangeable because the brain is connected to the body and the body's connected to the brain, right? If I you know, pinprick my hand and it hurts, my brain registers it, where it happens. It's kind of an irrelevant discussion now. I think we really need to just appreciate that the nervous system is designed to orchestrate all the processes in the body, not just thinking and not just behavior. It really can be divided into five things. So there's sensation and sensation is really bound or restricted by the receptors in the body. So receptors in the eye that perceive photons, light energy, receptors in the skin that perceive pressure, you know, touch receptors, mm -hmm. smell, taste, hearing, et cetera. 
And the interesting thing about sensation and the fact that the nervous system needs to pay attention to sensation is it's non-negotiable. The nervous system of humans is designed to extract physical phenomenon from the universe that are non-negotiable, photons of light. I can't see in the infrared with my eyes, and I can't see ultraviolet light with my eyes, and I can't perceive that because I don't have the receptors for it. So, you know, other animals can perceive some of those things, but that leads us to the next thing, which is perception, which is which sensations are you paying attention to? So all the time you're sensing things, like right now your feet are sensing the contact with your shoes, but you're not thinking about it until I say that, uh -huh. and then you shift your perception. Right. So perception is like this spotlight. So the brain wants to constantly bring in sensation. It's non-negotiable what's coming in, it's just dependent on your environment. Perception is negotiable, you can control that. Because I just said shoes and you thought about your feet and mm -hmm. there you are. An animal context, an animal that, um, let's say is hunting or it needs food for its young. It's gonna feel agitation, that's stress, that's cortisol, it's like hunger. My babies might not eat, I might not eat. Maybe it's looking for a mate. It's gonna feel agitation and start looking and roaming and searching. Mm. Foraging, is it's called in the animal behavior world. It's foraging. At some point, it might catch a smell of something, uh, a potential mate or berries or a stream if it's thirsty. At that moment, dopamine is released and now it has energy to continue along that path. Mm. Whereas there's a specific pathway in the brain in, that's involved huh. in depression and disappointment that if it goes to that place and it turns out it was the wrong path, there's a signal that actually suppresses dopamine so that you don't repeat that mistake again. There are feelings, which can be a little bit nebulous, but feelings are a link between our emotion and it generally invokes the body, sensations in the body and concepts in the mind of what those sensations are about. That's really what emotions are. Animals definitely experience them. I'm kind of appalled to think that 10 years ago, people like, do animals have emotions? Of course they have emotions, right? Because those are bodily sensations merged with some perception. So of course they do. And sometimes people will experience tremendous anxiety in pursuit of their rewards. You know, the social situation or the, the goal or the book, or, you know, people imagine failure like crazy as, as I'm sure, you know, mm -hmm. we've all heard and seen. What's critical, again, is this cognitive appraisal, this interpretation of that, if you think of that anxiety as a natural system of getting you to move, of just biasing your body toward movement, toward action, as opposed to inaction, because that's what anxiety really is. It's a bias toward action. Then you can literally reshape the whole notion of what it feels like to have elevated heart rate, maybe trembling hands, maybe flushing of the face when one is doing public speaking. You do it enough times, you get pretty comfortable. Now, there are situations in life, I should just mention, such as sleep deprivation or uh, in particular, that tend to make this whole set of systems with prefrontal cortex and limbic stuff and ACC and insula kind of dysregulated. It makes it harder to manage. That goes without saying, right? You know, the quickest way to peel somebody apart is to sleep deprive them for two or three nights. One night, you're probably fine. Right, right. So, you know, all the basics of, of self-care, of good nutrition, social connection, sleep, uh, exercise, sunlight, those still apply. I just want to mention that. I, I want to make sure I answer your question about gene expression and, and permanent changes um, because I've, I've failed to do that thus far. One of the things that is absolutely key about the dopamine system is that it has a fast component. Dopamine is released, more adrenaline, aka epinephrine can be released and you can, re, you know, this sort of upward spiral of energy and, and, and sort of success with the occasional drops, right? I mean, nobody succeeds in every task, right? Sometimes the phone rings or the doorbell rings and you fail uh, you know, uh, goodness, you fail to clean the cup, you come home, like, are you gonna crash into a puddle of tears? No, you just clean it then and then put it away, right? And people will start to point that out and then it becomes harder to recruit people into your, your goals. So I think the key thing is to attach that sense of reward to the effort process. It's saying, look, I am oriented in the right direction and rewarding the things you're not doing. I'm not back on my heels, I'm not just staying you know, in bed broke, in the morning. Not, yeah. A good example of this came to me recently. I have a good friend, he did nine years in the SEAL teams. His name is Pat Dossett. And, and we were talking about, you know, the Admiral McRaven thing, you know, get up and make your bed. And, you know, and they, they really do that. And, and I think the way it was described was, um, you know, so at the end of the day, even if everything doesn't go well, your bed is still made. Mm -hmm. For me, that's not that big of a reward, frankly. Right. I, but I, and so I said that and I- <laughs> I well, love it though, I make my bed. I'm well, oh, I definitely make my bed in the morning. <laughs> but I mean, it, going back and seeing that at the end of a hard day, mm -hmm. 
it, it's not enough. I felt like there was something else there. Mm -hmm. So I asked him, he said, well, it's very interesting because part of it is about not just making your bed, but it's the things you're not doing by making your bed. You're not lying in bed and ruminating. Mm. You're not back on your heels. You're not on your phone. That's right. Yeah. When, so when you look at, and you have spent a lot of time with people in mm. high performing communities, mainly through some consulting work, but what you find is that, you know, we can all be either be back on our heels, flat footed or forward center of mass. Forward, yeah. And when you look at people who are in these high performance communities, they try and keep their center of mass forward. Almost, through what seem like trivial things, like making your bed or making the cup of coffee, but it's not just Watch about what you're doing, point, yeah. it's all the things you're not doing that can put you down the path of ruminating or put you down the path of um, unhealthy behavior. So the key to this is, if we wanna be very concrete, we should probably focus on actions, and I'll mm -hmm. use fitness as an example because it translates to everybody, whereas you know, people's circumstances sure. differ. Let's say somebody really wants to take on a fitness routine they hate running or they want to lose weight in a, in a healthy way. Testosterones are associated wins do winners tend to be able to win more. There's some, um, et cetera, but you know, if we want to bring this into the, the common world, you know, a few years back when I started doing some public facing education, I started getting a lot of questions, especially on YouTube from young males, um, about porn, pornography and masturbation. And, and this becomes very relevant here. We have to remember that this dopaminergic system had, is generalizable to many different behaviors, right? Academic pursuits, uh, sports pursuits, relationship pursuits. But fundamentally, it was, again, I wasn't a, a consultant at the design phase, but fundamentally it's tacked into the, the adaptive survival behaviors. And every species, including ours, has at least two major um, motivations, which is uh, to protect its young and to make more of itself, to make more young at some level. People can opt out of that, but one of the, the absolutely pathologic situations for any animal or human is to be able to access repeated dopamine surges without effort or any pursuit that's self-directed and or that's directed, I should say. So for instance, cocaine it's not controlled by them, it's controlled by the by the instructors. And I, I've always been struck by the fact that in order to to not in order to get through, you just have to not quit. Remember, people aren't being deselected. They're not saying, get out of here, you're not good enough. You're not. People are deciding that for themselves. Right.